Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's panel discussion. I'm Fran Siegel, Executive Director of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building the impact investing ecosystem. We work in a number of core areas, including contributing to a more enabling public policy environment for impact investing, working with select asset owners on shared opportunities and challenges, and partnering with others to build our movement. I'm really looking forward to today to discussing the work of a very unique collaboration called the Response, Recovery and Resilience Investment Coalition, the R3 Coalition for short, which was named after a common crisis response framework and was formed in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic to help mobilize and streamline the impact investing response. Today, it's clear that we're not in the midst of just one crisis, but a number. COVID-19, the ensuing economic fallout, uh, increasing awareness of systemic racism, and of course, climate change. And so I suspect that this framework of the three R's um, will continue to evolve alongside our changing circumstances, perhaps reflecting the need to reimagine systems beyond achieving resilience. And we'll talk about that today. A moment ago, I called the R3 Coalition unique because of the level of collaboration and established trust uh, was unprecedented in our field. And indeed, I think it was made possible by the unprecedented nature of the crisis set we were at that time and still are facing. Back in March, as it became clear that the public health crisis would continue to snowball into a massive economic crisis, I think many impact investors were eager to step up, but needed some forums, R3 being one of them, to do so in a more coordinated fashion. Um, it's our hope that the impact investing field can build on this powerful model of cooperation going forward. I'm thrilled to be joined by three uh, tremendous panelists. Uh, Amit Bori, CEO of the Global Impact Investing Network, also known as the GIN. Audrey Obara, Senior Investment Manager in, in the Nairobi, Kenya Regional Office of SWED Fund, and Meredith Shields, Managing Director of Impact Investing at the Sorensen Impact Foundation. We will leave time for audience Q&A at the end of, of the session, so please pose your questions to the panelists using the chat box function, uh, and feel free to do so during the time that we're speaking so that we can comb through them and lift up um, um, some of your questions. So again, thank you, Audrey, Amit, and Meredith for being here today. I'd like to start by delving into the story of how R3 Coalition came into being. I remarked a moment ago about the encouraging, though admittedly atypical nature of this level of collaboration among investors, foundations, and network organizations. And I think that that speaks to the severity of the crisis set at hand, uh, that those involved would take a leap of faith quickly and mobilize together. The Alliance, for example, jumped in um, and was excited to join the R3 Coalition effort as a partner network to help amplify the work. So Amit, I'd love to start with you. Could you share a bit about the early motivations for forming the R3 Coalition and speak to the structure of the group as well as the strategies and activities that emer have emerged from the coalition? Absolutely. No, thank, thank you so much for that introduction, Fran. And I'm really thrilled to be here with my fellow panelists um, as well as uh, you know everyone we have in the audience. Um, you know, it, it was, um, you know, if you can take yourselves back to early March, um, you know, and it, it feels almost like a decade ago, given how, how much things have changed since then. Um, you know, the, the genesis of this was, um, you know, at this time, at least in, in the United States, and, and my organization is, is um, headquartered in New York. Um, and so that's where our staff sits. And we, at the time, we had an event planned to gather our members uh, here in New York City that we, of course, had to cancel um, due to the, the pandemic. Um, but we we were um, working very quickly to to move our team um, to make sure that they were safe and working remotely and ma managing those transitions. And also, we're working to mobilize our members, as for many other networks all around the world. Um, we had actually I had an email exchange with one of our um, uh, members on the Open Society Foundations with Sean Hinton there about how we're trying to mobilize impact investors to play our role in in responding to the crisis. Um, and we end up having a conversation about how you know, this might be an opportunity to try to drive something across you know, a, a coalition of networks effectively. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know the GIN, we are 
Um, a network of impact investors, as their name would suggest, that includes over 300 organizations um, in 50 countries. Um, our full network um, includes you know, over 30,000 people around the world. Um, but we work with a variety of other networks. And, and very quickly, um, we work with a set of um, great foundations. Um, so, so Meredith is, is representing one of the, the six foundations that came in to support the launch of the coalition, um, as well as 12 networks, the gin being one of the 12. Um, we ended up staffing the secretariat, if you will. So just um, and, and a, a wonderful colleague of mine, Katrina No, who's who's in the audience, um, has led the the coalition. Um, you know, uh, and and the real orientation was around these three phrase uh, phases. Um, you know, the immediate response, the broader recovery, uh, and how do we shape you know, like more um, resilience in the system? You know, as we emerge from the crisis. Um, we knew that would be a multi-year effort and then one that would involve you know um, impact investing in different ways along that that trajectory um you know so in in the early phase we knew that uh, like the immediate response that government would be front and center of course as they should be with a public health crisis um, but there would be targeted opportunities for impact investors to play roles in helping to fill gaps and, and finance opportunities that help, could help stem and, and contain the crisis um, in the recovery, um, you know, I think there's a huge role for impact investment to play and for investment to play uh, broadly um, and ultimately to shape a more resilient system. Um, the work of the coalition was organized around three pillars. Um, and so one was around co-investment uh, co convening. So how we actually would get uh, members of the 12 networks together around specific opportunities to put money to work in companies that are playing a role in responding to the crisis. The idea is if we could shorten the timeline between, um, you know, um, you know, up to when a company would get the financing it needed, um, that would help like maximize the role in responding to the crisis. Um, we also, um, and, and I should mention that we had, uh, I believe, over eight convenings. Uh, many were in health, but also in food and agriculture, water and sanitation, and even education. Uh, we also worked on um, on issue briefs from a, a research standpoint. So how can we, you know, capture um, findings quickly, um, kind of real time, uh, and it helps um, disseminate those to impact investors who could use that research to inform their work. Um, and last but not least, we have a communications component to this work, which is really helping the broader, um, you know, kind of uh, market understand that investment plays a critical role in responding to the crisis, and um, you know, as a complement to the efforts of government and, and nonprofits. Um, and so, those three pillars really organized our work. Um, and, and it will, before I, I close out, just really want to thank all the partners who participated in this. Um, as Fran alluded to it, it was an incredible um, you know, degree of like collaboration. It was an incredibly challenging time. Um, you know, so everyone was going through like you know, organizational stress, personal stress, you know, people worried about their families, of course, and their safety. Um, but it was, um, I found it quite energizing to see how many of our partners stepped up so quickly uh, to figure this out with us and to make sure that we were doing our, our part. Um, you know, with a crisis of this nature, we knew we would have to collaborate differently and, and you know, our community has very much stepped up. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Um, Meredith, I'd love to um, go to you next and then Audrey, asking specifically about your motivations for becoming involved with the R3 Coalition and what your experiences have been participating in the investment convenings in particular. Sure, hi everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Meredith Shields, Managing Director at the Sorensen Impact Foundation. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm also in DC where we're having like a second wave of allergies, so apologies. Um, the Sorensen Impact Foundation is a family foundation. We're located in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and we were created to be an impact investor. So um, as of this moment, we invest out of our programs related portfolio in early stage ventures that are doing social good around the world. And we also invest out of a market rate portfolio that is now a fully diversified impact investing portfolio as well. Um, so our motivations for joining the R3 Coalition stem from the mission that we have, which is not only to invest, but also to accelerate the field. I think Jim Sorensen would say that his vision is that impact investing is investing and people think about uh, the way that their, that their dollars impact society overall. So 
for a while now, we've recognized that we spend so much time sourcing deals. We send people all over the world looking for opportunities, talking to entrepreneurs, developing relationships. And then we have a team of people who dive rigorous amounts of due diligence and we're the only ones that benefit from that and that that's not something that sits well with our organization and certainly not Jim who wants to promote the field overall um, so we have over the last couple of years experimented with different ways of sharing information but what we liked about the R3 coalition is that we felt like in this moment, they were quickly assembling a group that could overcome the biggest barriers to teamwork and collaboration. So in the financial sector, we know there's this sense of a proprietary deal or a proprietary process. Um, and in this moment, in this year, we can't think that way. We need to work together. We need to move faster, put more money out the door. And the R3 coalition, by bringing people together, um, to share deals more broadly, to develop trust, to develop transparency, um, was able to do just that. So we have presented three of our deals over the last couple of months. Um, we have tried to bring other partner networks into the organization as well. And so for us, um, what the moment that the R3 Coalition seized to meet this crisis is a moment that we also hope will be a launch point for the broader impact investing field um, to continue to work more effectively and efficiently over time as well. Thanks, Margot. Audrey, are you, are, 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 can we hear you? We can't. Um, okay. Do we think that there's any way to troubleshoot? Like, um, Amit, what about that idea if Audrey calls you and that you can put her on speaker? Um, or if anyone in the chat has any, someone said uh, you could use your headset, but I think you've already tried that, Audrey. Um, you know, what, I'll, I'll work on it offline to see if we can get audio via phones. Um, so, Audrey, I'll, I'll shoot you a quick email and, and we'll, we'll try to set this up. Okay. All right. Well, Meredith, if it's okay with you, we'll we'll stick with you for now as uh, Ahmed and Audrey troubleshoot a little bit. Um, but but we'll want to go back to the the R three coalition um, when when we can hear Audrey. Um, so we'd love to move to uh, the response phase. So again, the R three coalition, where the three R's refer to response, recovery, um, and resilience. Resilience, and then we are kind of adding a a, a fourth R, potentially reimagining, um, uh, which is perhaps. Resilience is part of that. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so wondering if you alluded to it a little bit, Meredith, in your um, opening remarks about uh, you know the old world of flying around and doing due diligence. Could you talk a little bit about um, how uh, in, in this moment of, of COVID, um, how has it changed your the way you operate have you created new approaches to impact investing or used new tools? And uh, how have you supported investees and uh, potential in investees in this in this new uh, in this new phase? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think like a lot of organizations out there, everything we're doing right now is new. Um, I'm sitting in my house, and my team and I we see each other on little boxes on a screen. Um, just like this. And um, I'll, I'll kind of take through the way that we've approached this. Um, so first of all, we, we have a portfolio of about 50 early stage companies who initially we wanted to make sure that we could support in the best way possible. And for a foundation like ours, who's also a field builder, we felt like the biggest asset we had to bring to the table was our network. Um, and being able to get our portfolio company stories out there and in front of others um, and frankly find co-investors who we felt like would be supportive to the companies, but also people that we could work really well with um, to try and try and save the work and the impact that had been created prior to earlier in 2020. Um, so 
part of the changes that we're making. So we've made changes at all levels of our process. Um, on the pipeline level, we can't fly around the world. I guess we could, but we're not right now. Um, and so we are relying on our partners and the R3 coalition has been a great source of deal flow for incredibly valuable to, to dial into a call and hear and see principles from our partner organizations explaining their investment thesis, their impact thesis, and why they proceeded with an investment. Um, we found that to be much more powerful and helpful in getting a deal from the lead to the actual pipeline um, than some, some previous efforts we've seen. Um, Aside from deal sourcing and looking at partners for that, we're also conducting due diligence virtually, which talk about a process and a, a norm of the industry that is a little um, taboo to disrupt. There's there's always been, I think, a, a feeling that if you're not meeting a management team in person, if you're not going out and kicking the tires, if you will, and seeing a company, um, then how do you make a, a, a good decision? Um, and we've answered that question through, again, collaboration. Um, it's a word you're going to hear a lot in this, this session. But from a due diligence perspective, we have a number of partners who we trust. And we have been able to accelerate the learning about um, and developing trust in through this process. And bringing all of our collective information together, a meeting of the minds, if you will, um, has enabled us to overcome that hurdle that we can't we can't fly to Nairobi right now. We can't fly to India um, and meet companies, but we can work virtually and then rely on our partners to help us develop a meaningful level of information. Um, so that aspect of our process has changed. And then finally, we're very committed to sharing information in the biggest way possible. So some people, um, compliance folks who might be listening to this right now are um, cringing a little bit. And that's something that we explored. Um, but to the extent that it's allowable by our compliance and legal team, we share everything from our pipeline to our due diligence, um, all any and all research that we conduct. Um, and we, we were doing that before informally. Now it's very formal and methodical. Um, and our hope is that things like that will continue because it, it feels like all boats rise um, by changes in our process like that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, any word from Audrey? Uh, Katrina's working on it, so okay. I'm, I'm, I'm available to you, and okay. Katrina might join. Thank you. I'd love to. to, to okay. Um, Can you hear me? We, we can hear you, but there's a feedback loop of the audio, I think. Okay. Um, Better? Thumbs up if it's. Yes. Yes, we've got it. <laughs> Audrey? I, so, Slack Fund, if, if I could say something quickly about uh, uh, why we, we took part in the R3 coalition. Please. Um, traditionally, we invest in expansion uh, growth capital. However, in healthcare, we know that a lot of investments we see uh, leave out uh, underserved uh, segments of people, either women, children, rural populations. And so we, 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 we're starting to look at earlier stage um, companies and innovative companies. Of course, older companies can also innovate, but we find the younger companies, you know, being able to do that a bit faster. And so as through the RC coalition, we did get to speak to very interesting companies. Um, incidentally, Meredith uh, sits, uh, is an investor in one company that we have recently made an investment in, uh, Kasha Global, and then other companies that are working in East Africa uh, in the side of uh, healthcare uh, services to under segments. And so we, we 
Archie was very helpful because uh, there was an introduction made to some of the companies. Uh, Katrina facilitated our first meeting and um, we, we will continue to follow these companies because we think what they're doing is very interesting. And while we may not have made an investment at this point, you know, in, in the coming years, there are definitely companies that we want to work with. Audrey, thank you. And can you continue on a bit and uh, share a little bit about how you have approached um, new potential investees, how you have supported existing investees during this time, perhaps in a in a different way than you have in the past? So I'll speak about existing companies. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Sweatband has used over the years uh, is technical assistance to de-risk the investments that we make. Um, and, and we've used it in sustainability to support companies in that area. And then over the years, that has gone further into other things such as gender and digitalization. And and, and so when, when COVID you know, hit some of our operating companies in Africa and Asia, one of the biggest risks was to the people working in these companies. Uh, would they be able to carry on the activities which are critical at the same time, keeping themselves safe and their families? So one of the quickest needs that was identified was to, uh, for some of them, was PPE, because this was not something they had uh, put in their budget for that year. Uh, and when the pandemic hit, the cost of some of these items were so astronomical. Uh, you know, masks were going at 20 or 30 times. The price, the normal price, and so you know, before the supply chain began to stabilize, one of the things we did was to support our portfolio companies uh, with PPE. The other thing was around protocols and processes in how they see their patients, uh, with the workflow, uh, and 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 some of it involved a little bit of construction here and there. Uh, so those, those were the quick. Uh, uh, things that we did and then training is something else that we've also then supported the companies and some of it is still ongoing uh, and now you know the supply chain has, has stabilized and so the companies now have been able to build some of this back into their working capital and their workflows uh, but at that time it was really critical for them to continue to offer services to their patients to keep patients safe and to keep uh, their personnel safe. Mm. Audrey thank you and we can hear you perfectly, so thank you, and thank you, Katrina. Except um, maybe, Audrey, when you're not speaking, if you can um, both Katrina and Audrey mute yourselves, because uh, we're getting a little feedback. Or Ike may be able to mute you. OK, Amit, <laughs> thank you for, for being patient. Um, so one of the um, key components of the R3 coalition that you alluded to in your opening remarks was the collection of market intelligence related to the financing needs of, of companies and um, best practices and strategies to meet those needs. And I have really admired um, uh, how rapidly and thoughtfully uh, the GIN research team has gathered information and delivered valuable uh, research to the field at this time when we when we desperately need ideas around how to work with investees. So I'm wondering if you could highlight some of the key findings, especially insofar as they might align with some of the strategies that Meredith and Audrey lifted up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, they, they mirror them quite well, I, I think, just to highlight some of the experiences that we saw so early on. I mean, it, it was really wonderful to, to work with a lot of the partner networks to try to surface data about what's happening. Um, you know, normally we we often end up at events like SOCAP and others to get a read on the pulse of what's happening in the market, and of course that that wasn't available to us in that way, uh, particularly early in the year. And and so um, it was very important for us to get the information in the hands of investors during incredibly volatile and uncertain times that would help them be as effective uh, at responding to the crisis as possible. Um, we actually partnered with um, with Andy, um, you know, the Aspen Network for Development Entrepreneurs, on one of the pieces that really looked at. Um, kind of some uh, highlighted some of the research that they had done and added some that we were doing around, um, you know, how investors were responding to the crisis in general and what were some of the certain needs surfacing. Um, we also did a, a specific piece on some of the issues that both Meredith and Audrey highlighted around, like portfolio protection. Like, you know, how are 
investors trying to shore up the companies that they're already invested in and help them weather the storm. Uh, and we found that, you know, in the early days in particular, a lot of investors were, of course, focused on that, about how they can support their portfolio companies, whether it's with, with capital, with technical assistance, with, you know, it's, um, you know I, um, Audrey mentioned PPE and just getting some basic equipment that to sustain operations, but also things like how do you kind of like adapt your supply chain and, and how do you think about like opportunities um, you know, to um, you know, adapt your business model in light of not only the near-term impacts, but the, the you know expected longer um, time horizon of the effects of the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we found, you know, early on in some of the, the research, um, you know, was, was also that there was um, you know a number of investors. I think it was around a third who were really trying to identify better, like more impact investment opportunities um, as their key challenge. But a greater number were actually focused on the issues that Meredith spoke to around how do you actually conduct due diligence and process deals in your pipeline with the shifts to physical travel and, and communication and, and access to data. And so a lot of investors were really working to adapt their processes you know, very quickly um, and identify new ways of collaborating. You know, and as Meredith said, that is a theme you'll hear loud and clear in many different levels in this conversation. Uh, but many investors were striking partnerships with local partners trying to figure out how they could trust co-investors and, and rely on their due diligence and analysis um, and be follow-on investors in some cases so they could still uh, source new deals with organizations that they hadn't worked with in the past. Um, the last research brief of the four that I do, I do want to highlight something that's really important and I think gets to something that Fran wanted to speak about later in the conversation was that given um, you know, the inequities that were highlighted by the pandemic, um, huge issues around socioeconomic inequities, um, you know, and, and, and those were exacerbated by kind of like differences in, in race and ethnicity and in gender. We found that a lot of existing impact investors were revisiting their practices more broadly about how they can build more resilience um, into the way they invest writ large. So not just kind of COVID response deals, but how they could actually you know, reflect on representation in their management teams, on their investment committees, how they source, you know, um, you know uh, kind of, um, investment opportunities from different communities, uh, how they actually build businesses that are more responsive um, to racial and gender differences. Um, and that last piece focus on resilience and social inequities, I think was a really powerful piece that highlighted a lot of um, adaptation that investors were doing um, in just a span of a couple months to really try to like back up this interest in, in working differently um, with real action. Um, and we we did highlight a number of investors' activities, including Sorensen Foundation's work on this. Um, and, and I do you know recommend that as, as something to take a look at. They're all pretty short briefs. Uh, they're brief by design and uh, designed to be very digestible. Uh, but the idea is to surface some of the real-time adaptations and lessons that, that investors are highlighting. Um, throughout the flow of the um, or the unfolding of the pandemic. Thanks, Amit. Um, and th that's a great bridge to what I wanted to explore with you folks next. Um, and that is the second and third R's, recovery and resilience, um, which are as important as our response efforts. Um, and we've we've already touched on a couple times that there's likely a fourth R of reimagining. Um, and you touched on uh, that we're a missed a long overdue reckoning with systemic racism, white supremacy in our institutions. And so it's not just enough to rebuild existing systems that have uh, uh, racism in the, in, the, uh, in the roots of that system, but many of us feel like we uh, should be thinking about and acting upon a full scale reset. So I'm wondering how each of your organizations is thinking about recovery and broader systems change. Um, Meredith, I'm wondering if I could start with you um, again, uh, if you could share some thoughts. Sure. Um, so first of all, I'll say, I'll give you a little context for how we thought about change and then I'll lay out what we're changing. Um, in the midst of this crisis, as Amit and Fran said, we, we saw that the system isn't working for everybody and it's really not working for a lot of communities. Um, so we thought that 
it was imperative on us as a member of the impact investing community, as a member of the philanthropy community, and as a member of the finance community, which is a critical aspect of the functioning of our society, um, to examine what we've been doing that could potentially be contributing to the problem. And I mentioned this before, but I think a lot of industries are full of cultural norms and historical traditions and just the way things are done. Um, and so within our organization, the first thing we did was examined the way things are done and determined whether or not there were aspects of our process um, that were inadvertently leaving people out, leaving communities out and potentially exacerbating um, a problem. And so um, as we as we listened and learned and went through that process, a couple things stuck out to us. So first of all, um, I have to admit, usually this time of year in San Francisco, we have like 20 people all over SOCAP meeting entrepreneurs. Um, and we and we have great portfolio companies that have come through meeting entrepreneurs at SOCAP and other conferences. Um, but when you think about that, you can start to, to recognize that that method of deal sourcing, that wasn't our primary method, but that method of deal sourcing leaves a lot of people out. This is a conference in one part of the world that requires you to pay to go. Um, and so things like that, we, we took a hard look at and decided that from a deal sourcing perspective, we want to be more intentional. Um, we have intentionally reached out and are developing relationships with U.S. Black and Brown Founder Networks and Entrepreneur Support Organizations. Um, and instead of um, instead of only letting the entrepreneurs come and, and find Jim and pitch, um, we are reaching out and and seeking to source a more diverse pipeline of potential investments. Um, so we're taking our legacy process and adding to it. Um, the next thing that we have done is um, we put some metrics around this like we would do for any portfolio company. Um, and our board has mandated that at least 25% of the companies that go through our full scale due diligence, so the big long workup, um, will be from black and brown founders in the United States. Um, and so that is, is part of our commitment to make sure that we are intentionally sourcing um, from diverse communities. Um, another thing that we're doing is focusing on at a broader level, democratizing access to capital. Um, building, building wealth in communities, we believe, is really important to, to creating a more equal playing field. Um, and so through efforts like, um, like we're supporting Village Capital's Abaca platform, which seeks to match investors and entrepreneurs on the basis of the deal stage and company match um, versus a warm lead or a relationship. Um, and other, other ideas like that we have, we've been supportive of in terms of trying to think through how can we make access to capital more widespread. Um, and again, that's a part of why we're sharing our deal flow and we're also looking for others to share with us um, as well. And, and then finally, another initiative that we're undertaking um, is we're developing a post-investment support technical assistance facility, which I know Audrey and, and Swed Fund um, already do really well, but we, we invest in very early stage companies, um, often in low income communities, over 80% of the beneficiaries of our investments are in low income communities. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not just writing a check, we are providing a level of support that's helpful in getting those companies to the next, next level um, so that they can create opportunities um, for their communities overall. And so that's something that you'll hear from us soon. I might be mentioning it prematurely, but offering technical assistance um, and trying to work to support entrepreneurs and therefore communities is another change in our process that's coming as a result of, of 2020, if you will. Thanks, Meredith. Um, Audrey, can you talk a little bit about how SWED Fund is thinking about recovery and resilience as well as broader systems change? Recovery. Can you hear me? 
me now? Great, okay. So, so that's why we remain committed to making investments in in healthcare and energy and financial inclusion, which are our sectors of focus. Within healthcare, where I sit, we are keen to work with the least developed countries um, and also, you know, the up, lower middle income countries as well in Africa and Asia. And we remain committed to finding companies and entrepreneurs who are looking to create access and enhance affordability of quality healthcare. Um, traditionally, you know, we've done a lot of hospitals and clinics, but now we are looking beyond that as well. And uh, in India, recently, we made an investment into a fund that invests in SMEs and early stage companies. While whilst we may not be able to make those investments uh, directly through the fund, given the size of the team, we are looking to work with intermediaries uh, that can reach some of the smaller SMEs and uh, smaller and younger companies. We will also look at some of these companies ourselves in the future scale where Swart Fund can come in and make that investment. So we remain committed to these markets. Uh, even through the pandemic, we continue to work through diligence of companies um, from our desks uh, uh, or from home. It's, it's, it's um, you know, next year we still want to increase our investment uh, in terms of the ticket sizes, we want to increase our focus. We want to look at areas around distribution, uh, supply chain, uh, of drugs, uh, of medical equipment. Uh, we want to look at financiers who offer um, smaller loans, you know, tickets of, say, $100. Sometimes uh, a facility might just need $100 to buy some drugs or to pay their workers uh, to tickets that, uh, you know, are larger, $50,000, $100,000. Uh, to two million businesses in terms of loans, and then we also do want to work on the quality side of healthcare to make sure that uh, providers are uh, enhancing their quality. So in Africa, the state care accreditation uh, that has gained a lot of traction in this market. So we do want to support uh, our portfolio companies to gain uh, accreditation if they're at level one to improve that to level two, uh, all the way up to level five. In India as well, we have two fund investments there. Uh, one fund looking at larger deals, but another smaller one looking at uh, the SMEs. And then, you know, we do want to look at other intermediaries that we can work with as well. Thank you, Audrey. Um, Ahmed, um, the Jin uh, and, and other organizations in our field are uh, thinking about broader systems change um, when we think about uh, capitalism itself and uh, wondering how the current crisis set has shaped your thinking around the urgency of broader systems change. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for the question. And, and for those of you who have um, you know, followed some of our work over the years, a, a couple of years ago, we came out with um, you know, kind of a, a, a market strategy, if you will. Um, so this is you know, coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the gin, the coining of the term impact investing, we um, wanted to take stock of what was happening in the market um, and really take a, like a, a sharp look at where the opportunities were going forward. So we, we published this document called the Roadmap for the Future of Financial Markets. And the reason it was oriented around the future of financial markets was this recognition that if you care about impact or on issues like addressing poverty or climate change, what was really critical was to not just grow the impact investing market or your own deals, your own portfolios, but rather to look at how we can like shift the overall system. So how we can have an impact on investing itself. Now the, the COVID crisis in many ways has accelerated our, our, the, the urgency of this as, as Fran put it, but also I think um, uh, uh, increased the opportunity for driving real systems change. Um, and, and because I think there's a much broader um, you know, recognition of some of the words that, that Meredith shared around that, like the system we have today is, is not working. Right, it's not working for people. It's not working for planets, and it's not working well for investors. Um, and so, one of the things that we, um, well, a couple of things that we've been plugged on is into is um, we've been working with a number of other organizations around something called the New Capitalism Project, which is uh, the the goal of that is to share is to develop a shared vision of what the future of capitalism could look like. Uh, I realize it's a bit lofty, but really trying to stitch together um, a shared vision and agenda. From all these great efforts that exist out there around things like impact investing, 
benefit corporations, inclusive capitalism, regenerative capitalism, sustainable capitalism, and so on. Um, but trying to see if we can identify what is a, a shared kind of vision for what that future would look like. Um, another um, you know, project that uh, our coalition, or sorry, network that have just recently been uh, joined is called Imperative 21, uh, which is really focused um, on setting a new business imperative for the 21st century. Uh, and there are nine different groups that are, that are part of that, the gym being one of those. Um, but have, you know, have the, the orientation is really on how do we drive the development of a, a capitalist system that is more responsive to the needs of, uh, of all stakeholders not just shareholders, but also customers, employees, communities, and the planet. Um, they actually just launched a campaign uh, several weeks ago called Reset Capitalism uh, that you may have seen. It had um, it was on the, the stock exchanges in, in New York, um, at, at NASDAQ, um, in Brazil, and, and you know, um, it really had visibility all over the world. But the idea was to, to start to stimulate a conversation of how we can change capitalism to be more responsive to the needs of all stakeholders how we could design for independence, uh, how we can you know, uh, invest for justice, uh, and how we can account for the impact on a broader set of stakeholders. Um, but I, I mentioned these efforts, like New Capitalism Project, um, you know, the, the Imperative 21 effort, all in, you know, hopefully in service of a broader systemic shift that I hope everyone you know, in the room sees themselves as part of. You know, how can we actually make investments, recover from this crisis in a way that leads towards a, a better system that is more resilient and more inclusive on the other side of, of the pandemic. Thank you, Ahmed. That's that's. Uh, I want to live in that world. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us do, and um, many of us in the field are excited to to partner on this and um, encouraging folks to ask any questions in the chat because we'll turn to your questions in a moment, but. It just occurs to me that, you know, as we're thinking about broader systems change, as we're thinking about access, um, as we're thinking about uh, wealth, income, gender, racial equality, um, so much of these uh, big systemic shifts require real collaboration, radical collaboration. And I think that the crisis set that we have been um, experiencing and attuned to uh, during the last six, seven months has uh, engendered a lot of reflection from those in the field. And, uh, and ha we have, many of us have taken this radical collaborative posture. And I think R3 Coalition is a perfect example of that. I'm struck uh, by, you know, how, how you all have mentioned the word trust um, and how trust is really required and trust is really important in collaboration. And wondering if, if um, any of you have thoughts on how we can build on the momentum of these models of radical collaboration going forward in our field. And happy to have uh, you know anyone jump in who wants to wants to do so. I'm, I'm I'm happy to speak if there's no takers <laughs> to, to lead. Um, I like I I think in in many ways um, you know, just reflecting on kind of you know what we have going on in the world is that like it, it is in some ways it is like the worst time to try to uh, attempt new collaboration in part because everyone's spread so thin you know, everyone's weighing kind of the weight of like what's happening to their you know safety of their families what's happening to their communities their organizations their portfolios and so on um but i do think that you know a, a global crisis does require global response and it, and it did create an openness for everyone realizing like that we do need to figure out ways to collaborate differently. And, and I think where we're at with the R3 Coalition, I hope, is just the beginning of that. Um, you know, you know, we have, um, like, people have engaged in different ways, and it's still very early for kind of a, a global collaborative effort like this. We're just, uh, I think, about five months in and, and you know, since the launch of it. Um, but I do think this overall notion of, like, um, you know, how do you create more opportunities to figure out a, a shared agenda and, and, and a shared vision and work towards that, while recognizing that, you know, there are different approaches, different priorities, et cetera, is really important. And when we think about an issue like systems change, um, you know, obviously that is, it's hard to get your head around what it would take to the entire system, um, but it is essential that we, we collaborate. And you know, whether it's, you know, across networks and impact investing, or it's investor committee, business and NGOs and governments, absolutely critical 
Um, but I think one thing that um, on this theme of trust is really important. That I do think one of the multiple crises we're experiencing at this moment in the world is a crisis of like trust and confidence. Um, and and so part of that, what's really important for us to you know, um, you know I think turn the tide, um, you know, on, on that current is really to invest in building the real trust um, and invest in the relationships, uh, even if we have to do it through Zoom and, and other platforms. Um, but ultimately, it is like our interdependence that we'll lean into and, and our, our kind of interconnectedness that will really um, pull us out of this crisis. Mm. Thank you, Amit. Audrey, Meredith, Meredith, would you like to hop in? Yeah, I, I was just going to say I, I really um, appreciated how Amit phrased it. Um, but I, I do think, you know, one way that we've been thinking about this question internally is that as investors, we go out and speak to entrepreneurs and industry leaders and we ask them to disrupt for good. We want them to change the way things are done and create a better world. And we feel like it's really important as an impact investing community that we ask ourselves the same question. And, and collaboration, in my mind, is one of the ways that we can do better and work faster and do more. Um, and so I, I think as we think about how do we accelerate and build on these frameworks in the future, it's going to take a little bit of a culture shift um, and maybe even we need to see a tipping point of enough organizations saying, yep, we're going to try something new. We're going to change our process and that's going to be okay. Um, and, and as soon as we see enough organizations doing that and committing to that, I think we'll start to see the benefits. Um, it Collaboration tends to, to lead to more effective, efficient, faster results. And once we can see that, um, my idealistic hope is that um, we change the cultural norm. We change the way that things are done for the better, like, like we ask our, our entrepreneurs and our innovators to do. Mm. Thanks, Merida. Audrey, would you like to hop in? If I may add to that, we we have seen a lot more collaboration, and as I speak, different opportunities uh, within healthcare uh, on a wide range range of issues, from vaccine, uh, creating a vaccine, uh, to to creating pharma manufacturing in Africa, to financing for SMEs, and to invest in high development impact projects that are not yet scalable, but you know that then, you know, uh, get to a position of scale to attract larger pools of capital. And across this, I'm seeing collaboration from foundations, I'm seeing collaboration from government, I'm seeing collaboration from development finance institutions, private equity funds and corporates. So a lot of funding from across the spectrum that traditionally did not work together, uh, you can just see the private capital or government on one side, but there's a lot more discussion on collaboration and I see that uh, continuing to grow if we have to tackle many of the challenges that we are facing right now. Thank you, Audrey. I'm, I'm just scanning some of your questions. There seems to be a cluster of questions around um, access to capital issues, which is something that Mark, uh, that uh, Meredith touched on a moment ago. Um, and uh, this feeling among impact entrepreneurs and, and even uh, uh, impact enterprise NGOs, so for-profit and non-profit, you know, what is the way in? And I think, you know, one of the uh, promises of our three coalition is access. Uh, but the point of access, you, uh, my understanding is that you need to have an investor be uh, supporting your deal in order to bring it in, within that forum. And so as we think about access to capital issues for women, um, black and brown entrepreneurs, uh, uh, tribal uh, entrepreneurs, other folks of color, how can we um, create more access to capital um, in the, at this time, especially? I can start there. Um, so like I said before, I, I think that if we, as a community, take a look at 
what we've been doing, there's been some inadvertent exclusion in, um, and access to capital is not available for everybody and hasn't been. Um, and so the first thing is removing some of those barriers and, um, you know, not to pick on conferences, but just to think through how much of your deal flow comes through mediums that are only accessible to some people. Um, and, and then also using platforms that remove some of the the warm lead aspects that could cause you to prejudge an investment, maybe even without knowing it. So um, Abacus platform, which I think Katrina sent out over the, the chat is, is one way. R3, of course, is another where you get to see the, the benefit of everybody's deal sourcing in, in one place um, and learn more about a company maybe that you wouldn't have ordinarily learned about. Um, and and I think just the word intentionality sticks out to me. So if you want to improve access to capital, you have to be willing to take a step back and look at where your blind spots are um, and, and track yourself and make sure, like, are, are we, are, are, is our pipeline reflective of the opportunities and the needs um, in society? So that's how we think about it. Mm -hmm. um, Audrey, you, you, um lead the sweat fund work in Kenya. And um, how, how do you think about um, implicit bias in your work, um, you know, given that you're serving uh, a broad geography? Um, how do you think about uh, access to capital issues in your context? It's a good question. Uh, being in Nairobi, we tend to find, we find a lot of deals in Kenya, uh, though our focus is in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so one of the things that we, um, we, 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 we try to do a lot is create a lot of visibility for our work, um, mostly through conferences. Um, and, and, you know, we're quite accessible. If you go to Swetland's website, you can find my telephone number, you will find my email address. So you can send me uh, a proposal of a, um, if you're looking to raise capital, and, and receive proposals from quite diverse uh, places in the world, uh, you know, Libya, uh, somewhere in Myanmar, uh, to, to, you know, places in Africa. Um, but, you know, as, as, as Meredith says, um, a lot of our deal sourcing has been either through network people we know and through conferences and sometimes not all people can attend conferences. But because our, our investments have been in growth stage companies that look for tickets of you know, at least $5 million, many of those targets would, could find their way to some of these uh, areas where they can access us. But I think, you know, for the smaller companies, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, I do see incubators and accelerators coming up in this region, the challenges where some of these uh, smaller companies are given a platform. And, and so, you know, we, we are happy to support those you know, through um, um, participation and advice for some of the other entrepreneurs, even though they might not be at the stage for sweat fund just yet. Great, thank you. Um, we're nearing uh, the end of our time together, and I was wondering if we could end on a high note, although I think that uh, this conversation has been very hopeful um, and, and very much about collaboration and the future and systems change. But, uh, you know, Amit talked about how thinly we're all spread and that this has been a very tough year. Uh, we're facing an interesting election in the United States in just a matter of weeks. Um, and I'm wondering if you could each share um, something that has emerged as a silver lining for you um, during this uh, time of uh, and confluence of crises. And Amit, wondering, um, maybe I can start with you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I do, you know, it is just so important to you know, acknowledge that this has been such a challenging year. And um, there's no way to sugarcoat that, of course. But, but I do think one thing that is emerging that we've seen is that the second quarter of the year, like things were pretty quiet, and at least in, in our networks. Um, and but more recently, we've seen a lot of inbound interest in impact investing. And, and I think as we pivot to the recovery from this crisis, many investors who would not attend a SOCAP or would not attend a Gen Investor Forum or participate in, in, in these networks that we all work with, um, you know, are 
are now actually starting to recognize that if they want a world that is inclusive, just, and sustainable, that they have to invest differently. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a big moment for what everyone on, you know, on this call is working on around like putting impact front and center for investing more broadly. Um, I don't feel like you know, Pollyanna, uh, Pollyanna about it or you know, that this is just um, going to be easy. But I think the discipline that impact investors have honed of putting capital to work, have a positive measurable impact is something that is you know, going to have a lot more interest and attention um, from you know, major institutional investors, family offices, foundations, and others. Um, so it's an important time for us to really try to center the recovery around impact um, that it builds in these issues that we've been talking about, like around kind of inclusion, sustainability, um, and creating access and, and opportunity for, for more than um, our systems have in the past is absolutely critical. Mm. So, so that's where, what I, I'd posit for the, the silver lining of this, if you will. Great, thank you, Amit. Audrey, uh, what has been a silver lining for you during this tough time? I would say two things. Uh, one of them is that as an organization, and you know, when we look at our strategy uh, within healthcare, we, we are very conscious um, to, to, to focus on investments that are creating impact and that are serving uh, a broader segment of, of, of people. And then the second one has been on collaboration. Uh, previously, we may not have looked at models where there was grant funding in it uh, from a financial viability perspective, uh, but now we are more open to looking at such uh, models because we realize it's going to take a blended uh, collaboration from different actors to solve a lot of the challenges that we find in, in many of the countries that we operate. And specifically, like in healthcare, it, it really needs a broad range of stakeholders to come together. Uh, to address all the issues of access, affordability, quality, efficiency. We, we must work together. Mm. Thank you, Audrey. Meredith? Sure. Um, the silver lining, um, in my view, is, is two part. Um, first, without echoing too much of what's said before, I think you know, um, a rational person always says collaboration is great, but in this time where resources are constrained and people are stretched too thin, it, it's almost worse. It, it's required. Um, and so something that's exciting to me, if we need a silver lining, um, is that I, I do think we're going to see more instances of where winning or secret sauce comes from caring about impact and doing it effectively by collaborating with others. So what I mean by that is taking taking a multi-stakeholder approach. I think the companies that win coming out of this um, will be the companies that think about how they treat their employees, how resilient their employees are, how um, they can reduce turnover, reduce health issues, um, focus on upskilling um, and, and other issues that we're seeing exacerbated right now. And so um, if we need something positive to look at, I, I am hopeful that a good outcome from this crisis will be that the companies who succeed will be the ones who actually um, dedicate some time to thinking about the impact that they have on the, the people that they serve, as well as their employees, investors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Meredith, thank you so much for those closing thoughts. Audrey and Amit, uh, thank you for sharing uh, so much about uh, your the spirit with which you um, that you bring to the work at this time um, and before this time. But it's it's uh, it's great to hear about the collaboration and trust. Great to explore the R three coalition as an example, a very vibrant example of how uh, collaboration is in action. And um, I've, um, I'm trying to, uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, um, passing along from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, uh, I think that what you're all talking about is uh, rather than, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm stammering, but I, what I wanna say is impact primacy. Um, and I think that that's what you're talking about. So moving from the encumbered paradigm of um, 
shareholder primacy to one of impact primacy, kind of multi-stakeholder. And so that is uh, something that animates me and has been a silver lining. And just want to thank you so much for your work and the spirit of collaboration that you bring to it. So thank you. And thank you to the folks who have joined, uh, joined us today. Thank you for your comments and wishing you a great SOCAP. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.